Hey everyone, so this Unit 9 video uh, covers a few of the more influential intelligence theorists. Uh, essentially, all of these people had ideas about uh, what types of intelligences should matter, um, you know, how many different ways maybe intelligence should be divided and looked at, um, you know, possibly how many different types or forms of measurable intelligence might there be. Uh, so I just very uh, quickly want to go through four of them that may or may not appear on the AP exam. Um, so very quickly, uh, his name is Charles Spearman. Um, you need to uh, know that he has what is called or what he proposed as general factor intelligence. Uh, sometimes the G for general is often just shown as an italicized G by itself. So sometimes G factor or G general factor intelligence. And basically, um, uh, um, Charles Spearman is suggesting that um, a way we look at intelligence the same way we look at factor analysis. If we test you on a broad variety of things, we may note that for the most part, you tend to either score well in established clusters or you don't tend to score well in established clusters. And that would suggest that there's probably an underlying general intelligence uh, or knack towards certain ad adaptations or abilities. So for example, if you typically excel, for example, in STEM fields, it usually isn't necessarily one particular area. Like if you're good at math, it's not usually that you're good in one type of math over another. If you're good in science or good in, for example, art, it's not usually that you're necessarily in good in one type of art and one type of art only. You're not usually uh, good at just one type of science or one type of athletic ability. Uh, many people can play multi, you know, multi-sport athletes. Many uh, musicians can play multiple um, instruments. They can often do a lot of other things things associated with music as well. Um, most people are not one-trick ponies when it comes to certain intellectual gifts. And that more or less just kind of reaffirms the idea of Charles Spearman's general factor intelligence that suggests that there probably is an underlying factor that suggests why you would be so good in certain areas in pretty much all the broad and diverse ways you could be measured in that particular way. Uh, for L.L. Thurston, I don't want to spend any real time on him at all. I don't generally recall the last time I saw him on the AP exam. However, make sure you definitely associate his name um, with um, intelligence theories. Also, um, essentially what L. O. Thurston is suggesting is he thinks we need to think more broadly about different types or categories of measurement for which you could do general factor intelligence. And so he developed seven areas, um, seven different measurable areas that he thought could be sub-criteria that essentially could be tested upon. Uh, I don't know them off the top of my head. I don't know that they would be relevant for you to know, but he basically suggested that when it comes to general factor intelligence, there are multiple ways for which you can divide these into sub-comprehensible groups, and those are the seven areas for which he uh, basically he, he argued. Now, one that is definitely more frequently appearing on the AP exam uh, is Robert Sternberg. Uh, Sternberg's theory is pictured here as well in your notes. I've got the three different circles here with critical thinking, creative thinking, and practical thinking. Uh, and so basically, uh, Robert Sternberg's theory is often referred to as triarchic intelligence because he does believe that there are basically three bubbles, uh, three different types of intelligence. They are somewhat overlapping. There's certainly a Venn-style diagram to them. But there are definitely three divisible main categories for which intelligence should be divided, and you could be good in one and not some of the others. You could be good in all three. You could be lacking in all three. Uh, but there's essentially three major types of ways he thinks intelligence comes about. One of them is what he calls critical analytical intelligence. Um, this is something you often see in things such as math, physics, uh, chemis chemistry, um, you know, coding, anything for which there is algorithms, anything for which there is step-by-step -step processes, anything for which it often involves a lot of linear thinking and like step-by-step -step algorithmic processing that allows you to then analyze and critique information, solving for problems, things of that nature. That's more of what he describes as critical analytical intelligence. Uh, creative intelligence is, is something more you see, you tend to see, for example, in the arts, uh, you tend to see in English. Uh, you tend to see in foreign languages, you tend to see in, in music and art um, um, and theater. So with creative intelligences, 
Um, the idea is, is that they teach you the skills, they teach you the techniques, and then you go about thinking outside the box in creative ways to take information you know and techniques you know and create completely new forms of, of creativity, completely new forms of work. So, for example, they may teach you writing techniques for short stories and poetry, and they teach you, you know, like schemes and stuff like that, but then you can create your own work. They may teach you in art classes, they may teach you certain techniques, certain ways to perform art, certain ways you can display it, and then you can go about doing your own thing. In sports, they may teach you some basic rules of the game, but then you can come up with your own game plan, your own strategy, your own offense, your own defense, obviously with music. Um, again, with English, stuff like that, there's a lot of flexibility there for creative interpretation of ideas that go beyond um, linear thought. It's more outside the box thinking. And then number three is what he called practical intelligence. You can think of practical intelligence as the capacity to do everyday social and uh, fundamental activities in your life. So you can think of this as street smarts, uh, people smarts money smarts, uh, people that have you know empathy and sympathy, people that relate to others well, people that are socially engaged, uh, people that are good at handling money, uh, people that are good with hands-on activities, um, like you know uh, tinkering around um, with things such as electronics or, or mechanics or uh, things of that nature. Um, so basically practical intelligence incorporate your ability to do kind of the everyday savviness that comes with associating with people and, and just everyday practical needs. Uh, so, and again, you could be good in some, you could be good in others. Some of you may not, you know, you may know people that are not necessarily classically gift, you know, gifted um, in terms of book smarts, but they're definitely very street savvy and they're very good in certain dynamics. Um, but, you know, most people tend to be good in at least one of the areas and many people are good in two or in sometimes cases all three areas because there is a lot of overlap, obviously, between them. Again, the chart here helps you out if you need that. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns about that, please let me know. Again, that is a fan favorite on the AP exam. And then that brings us to Howard Gardner's theory. Uh, Howard Gardner's theory is definitely the most unique one on this list. So if you've noticed, like with Thurstone, Spearman, Sternberg, what they're often describing is what we think of as classical definitions of intelligence, classical categories of intelligence, uh, definitely a more mainstream, more widely accepted way that intelligence is often thought of. Much of what Spearman and Sternberg, for example, uh, Thurstone described, those are the kind of things you're often asked on IQ tests. Those are often the ways we think of and when we measure the idea of like academic intelligence, uh, things of that nature. So so Howard Gardner's is a little bit different. Uh, so with Howard Gardner, he definitely takes a much broader, more vague view of what intelligence should be. And so he originally um, uh, coined seven, and then later he moved it up to eight. And I believe he ultimately may have moved it up to nine or beyond. Uh, but we're going to go with the basic eight uh, intelligences for which he developed. And so I, I just want to show him here real quick. Um, he described one known as verbal linguistic talent. Uh, that one's pretty self-explanatory. But obviously, if you're a good public speaker, if you're really good at English, if you're really good at poetry, if you're really good at script writing, you would be good at verbal linguistic. Um, logical mathematical, again, you can think of that as anything that's algorithmic based, so good at math, good at chemistry, good at statistics, good at uh, coding, things of that. Uh, visual spatial uh, has a lot to do with, uh, remember, spatial is your environment, so people who are good or adept at understanding um, like social situations, people that are good at reading a room, uh, people are good at relating and connecting to people um, and understanding how social dynamics work. Um, body kinesthetic, remember kinesthetic means movement, so if you're really talented at sports, if you're a great dancer, a great gymnast, um, if you're, you know, something like that, that would be body kinesthetic intelligences. Um, if you're musical rhythmic, if you're really good in any kind of musical talents, you know, with singing, with musical instruments, with compute, composing music, you know, doing anything related to coordinating or syn syncing up or sequencing uh, musical uh, abilities that would all be considered musical rhythmic. Uh, naturalistic are people that are really good hands-on 
with environmental things. And in this case, I don't mean social environment. I mean people that are good botanists, people that are good zoologists, people that would be good vets, people that would be good oceanographers, people that would be good meteorologists, uh, people that would be good forest rangers, people that would be good farmers. Uh, basically, people that are really good at understanding the animal kingdom, understanding the, the plant kingdom, understand the earth as a physical uh, entity. Uh, and then intra and interpersonal, make sure you know the difference between them. Uh, intrapersonal is being able to know yourself well. So the understanding that, you know, have a good understanding of your place in society, having good self-esteem, uh, understanding your goals, your motivations, your needs, uh, the ability to kind of read yourself and understand. And then interpersonal is the ability to really connect to people on a one-on-one -on -one level. So interpersonal would be like, you know, having empathy, sympathy, the ability to make an emotional connection to others, a really good way to, to basically connect with another human being, to understand their mindset, their point of view, uh, ways to help uh, connect with them. Those would all be considered interpersonal. Uh, again, I do believe he added some more later, but those are the ones that I know for a fact may be asked. Most of them are rather self-explanatory. Uh, the one thing I definitely want to point out about Howard Gardner's theory, um, of all the theories on here, his is definitely the most heavily criticized. Um, um, so, and, and the main reason why his theory is so heavily criticized is something that the AP exam has asked before. And so keep in mind that since his theory is less mainstream, his theory is less the status quo when it comes to the definition of intelligence, uh, many researchers, many psychologists, uh, for example, uh, one of the more famous living uh, active uh, psychologist, uh, Jordan Peterson, who I believe is out of the University of Toronto in Canada, uh, I believe he called Howard Gardner's theory rubbish. Um, but his logic was, is that what, uh, and this comes back to the criticism, and he's not the only one who shares this point of view. Many people have criticized Howard Gardner's theory for saying what he's often describing here is not intelligence. It's talents. It's skills. It's gifts. And so those are the, that's the most common criticism of Howard Gardner's theory, is that many of the things he's reaching for, many, you know, more traditional intelligence theorists says that's, that's, those are talents, those are skills, those are gifts, that's not intelligence. However, from Howard Gardner's point of view, his counter-argument would be that he is simply taking a very broad, very uh, vague view, uh, since intelligence is somewhat of a subjective definition, and since he is kind of giving a more um, outside-the-box view of intelligence, he is arguing that, yes, those are skills or talents, I suppose, but can't skills, talents, and gifts be considered intellectually um, um, ac accomplishments. Can't that be intelligence if that's something that you're actually good at? So he kind of has his own view of how he thinks intelligence works. So make sure you kind of have a basic idea of the intelligences. And definitely, like I said, the AP exam has asked multiple times about how is his theory different? Why is his theory criticized? And how does kind of Gar Howard Gardner kind of view his view of intelligence versus a more traditional uh, view of intelligence? But that's all I have for intelligence theorists. Uh, again, uh, make sure in another video, uh, please make sure you check out uh, all the people associated with intelligence testing, um, like Alfred Binet, uh, David Weschler, uh, Sir Francis Galton, Lewis Terman, make sure you know them because they help to develop IQ testing. Again, that is different from intelligence theorists altogether. But again, if you have any questions or concerns about any of these gentlemen, please let me know. I'm always here to help. Otherwise, hopefully you found this uh, video to be informative and useful. And that's it.